Good morning. My name is Ken Ludwig. I'm with the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. And we're here at uh, American Legion Post 72 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, today is September 9th, 19, or I'm, 2014. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Mr. Dennis Schoen, uh, who is a World War II veteran. Uh, and I'm proud to say he's also an elder alumni. Uh, so, Mr. Schoen, welcome and good morning to you, sir. Thank you, Ken. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Um, kind of like to start out by asking you a little family background uh, about your mom and dad, brothers and sisters, where you grew up, educational background, stuff like that. So, if you could start with that, I, I'd appreciate it. Okay, good. I was born in uh, Cheviot, Ohio, uh, in uh, October 28, 1921. I was also raised in Shivit. Uh, I attended uh, St. Martin's Elementary School uh, and uh, graduated from that school in 1935 and then attended Elder High School and graduated in 1939. Uh, from 1939 until I uh, was drafted into the Army I guess my first job was uh, with a photo developing company down on State Avenue. I think it was uh, owned and operated by the Kroger Company. Uh, I worked there, uh, well, summers while I was in high school, and then after I graduated, uh, I worked that summer also. And it was just a place they employed uh, young people during the, or during the summer uh, vacations. So from there, I, I uh, worked for a photo developing company, made photo stats, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know how long I was there, but uh, probably uh, maybe a year, year and a half. And from there, I uh, I uh, took a job with a grocery, comp uh, grocery store out in uh, Westwood and uh, I delivered groceries, worked in the store, and then... Uh, delivered groceries? I delivered groceries, <laughs> yes. I think we're starting to get back to that now. Oh, yeah. So. Anyhow, uh, I guess things started to heat up uh, in Germany, and uh, I took a job at the Wright Aeronautical Corporation. Uh, I was uh, operating an internal grinder. We made uh, reduction gear carriers for engines. And uh, I worked there, I was working there when uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. And uh, I worked there until February. 1943, uh, when I was drafted into the Army. Uh, I was given one six-month, uh, uh, what do they call it when they give you? A, a, a dispensation, because oh, okay. I was wor right. working in a war plant. And uh, and anyhow, in February 43, I was drafted. I was uh, drafted over at, uh, it was a funny thing, when, when I was drafted, I had to get a physical examination, and the draft board sent me to the physician that delivered me when I was <laughs> when I was born. And I remember saying to him, "You brought me into this world. Now you're going to take me out of it." Oh boy! <laughs> Thank anyhow, God that wasn't true. Yeah, right. I uh, I guess I was over Fort Thomas for about a week or so, and then uh, shipped out to. Uh, uh, Camp Roberts, California on a troop train. It took about five days to get there because we had a sidetrack for every scheduled uh, route. And uh, before we left Fort Thomas, I was, we were given all the shots, typhoid, tetanus, and so forth. And I was feverish all the way out on the train. So the first thing I did when I got to uh, Camp Roberts, went to the dispensary to get some aspirin for my fever. And it was 100.6. And they told me, you're going to the hospital. And I said, what for? All I want is 
from aspirin for my fever. We have a rule on the base. If your temperature is over 100, you go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital. I was in there about six weeks. Oh, my goodness. Not because of the fever, but because I contracted bronchitis from either somebody else or while I was in the hospital. As a result, I missed about the first six weeks of my basic training. So after I got out of the hospital and went back to my unit, first they were going to uh, require me to start over, take my basic training over. But then I went on to, to finish the training and uh, I was uh, shipped out to uh, uh, it was in Oakland where we left, a base in Oakland, and uh, put on a ship headed for I did not know where <laughs> until we were out to sea about two days, and they told us we were on our way to Australia. So we got to uh, Australia, Brisbane, and uh, we were at a replacement camp there for a few days. and. They loaded us on a truck with our full gear, and I thought, I'm on my way to New Guinea. I don't even know how to fire this rifle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a dead duck. <laughs> so it turned out uh, they sent me to uh, a headquarters unit, which was General MacArthur's headquarters. So I was in Australia, Brisbane. Uh, my job was a company clerk, and <coughs> I was there from February of 43 until January of 45. And most of the time I just worked at the, uh, uh, the office there, you know. And uh, from uh, January 45 then I was uh, assigned to uh, Philippines. But we stopped over at Hollandia for about a month and uh, from there, we went up to uh, Tolosa, Tacloban on the island of Leyte, and was there about uh, three or four weeks, and then finally uh, shipped up to Manila, and I was there about eight months. Uh, during the time uh, of my job as a company clerk, I was uh, promoted to well, I started out as private, obviously, and corporal and sergeant and staff sergeant. Mm -hmm. I was a uh, supply sergeant uh, in the Philippines. Well, I think before I left Australia, too. I'm not sure. But anyhow, that was the highest rank that I achieved, staff sergeant. So when you say supply sergeant, was that uh, replenishing, you know, uniforms? Yeah, or that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Equipment, you know, light equipment. Okay, any combat-related well, stuff, guys coming in and going out? No, uh -huh. not really, no. Uh, I had a unique experience, I think, when I was in uh, Manila, uh, when they dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. Uh, <clears throat> another GI and I were assigned to a project uh, about 10 miles outside of Manila. It was a four-story apartment building. Uh, the name of it was Rosario Apartments. I'll never forget that. And the uh, Japanese Marines occupied that. But before they were driven out, they blew up, blew up the top floor, all the windows. The building was a mess. So the other GI and I were assigned to uh, fix that building up with the help of about 10 Filipinos. And that's what we were doing when they dropped the bomb. Oh, they were going to build it high-ranking officers in this building when it was completed. So since the, the bomb was dropped, they decided not to do that. Instead, uh, we housed uh, delegates from all, all of our allies who were going to meet there prior to the signing of the surrender terms wow. on the USS Missouri and Tokyo Bay. And uh, that also included about a dozen Japanese officers. And uh, I recall 
one evening, uh, uh, we were in the lobby of this apartment building, and one of the young Japanese officers uh, took one of our GIs, who was a Japanese, uh, American, Japan, American of Japanese descent, took him over to the side, and they were talking, and I, after they finished, I, I asked this guy on our outfit, I said, what was he telling me? He said, he told me that uh, they considered me a traitor because, you know, he was of Japanese descent. Yeah. So, anyhow, uh, the next day they all left for uh, the signing of the surrender term. And I guess uh, that was in August, so it took from August to December to be uh, discharged. As a matter of fact, when they dropped the bomb, I had my orders to go to Japan, but that was canceled too. So, um, and what would what would those orders have been for to go to Japan? I mean, Tokyo, I was going <coughs> to Tokyo, before they dropped the bomb. Yeah, obviously. Oh right. yeah, right. Yeah, and after they dropped the bomb, that was canceled. So, were they planning an invasion there? That? I have no idea. Okay. Well, from August until December, it was just waiting to be discharged, and they were discharging you by points at that time. Mm -hmm. You got so many points for every month in the service, every month overseas, any kind of decorations. So I was uh, in uh, December 20, maybe 20th or 21st, was on my way to Seattle. Uh, and then from there I went to Camp Atterbury and was discharged there. Okay. December 20th. I noticed Sorry. on your biography form, um, uh, you were there for the Philippine Liberation. Yeah. Um, I don't remember I, anything about that, really. Expand, <laughs> it just happened that. that I wasn't a part of it. <laughs> well, because we know that uh, uh, the Japanese overran the Philippines when yeah. MacArthur was there. Right. And, yeah. uh, and so I didn't know if you were part of that group that came in that, that pushed them back out of there no, or not. No, no. Okay. I was not in combat at all. Okay. Um, okay, so then. Um, after I got out of the service, what did I do? After you got out of the service, what happened? <laughs> uh, <coughs> I took a job. Uh, I was eligible for the GI Bill, and I wanted to do something with it. So I had a cousin who was a carpenter, and he talked me into learning the carpentry trade. So I got a job with a contractor that did mostly uh, fire jobs and rehab stuff, you know. After about three months, I decided I didn't like that. I didn't want to do that. So I went down to the VA and uh, I went to the employment uh, office and I asked them, if there was any jobs that were available that I could learn under the GI Bill, you know. And uh, they said, took file cards out, rattling them and off. Came to this one, said it had an opening as a drug compounder. Now that sounds interesting, so I checked that out. Had a couple interviews, was hired, and I worked uh, on that job for about a year, and I really liked the work. But I thought, this company's not going anywhere. I don't have any future here. Uh, maybe I should try going to pharmacy college. You know, I still had like three and a half years of eligibility left. So I applied for um, entrance into pharmacy college in August of 47. And I talked to the dean. He said, well, we're all filled up this year. He looked at my high school credits and he said, I see the only thing you've ever had in high school is scientifically is general science. I said, that's right. He said, well, you're not eligible for pharmacy college for that. He said, well, I'll tell you what, if you go to UC at night and uh, take freshman English and chemistry, you get a B average or better. I'll take that into consideration along with having had a couple years experience working with drugs. So I did that, and I uh, enrolled in September of 1948.
I should say, I was married in uh, November of 46. And I had, uh, we had our first child in uh, September of 47. And uh, a second one on, uh, in uh, 1949. And third one in 1952. That was the year I graduated from college. I had three children wow. uh, attending my graduation exercise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's back up a little bit there. Where did you meet your wife, and did you know her prior to going into the service? I or? knew her, but had not dated her. She was she worked with my cousin <laughs> at uh, a box company, I think. Kale, I think the name of it was, down on Dalton Avenue. Anyhow, uh, she used to spend weekends with my cousin, and I would see her at my cousin's house. But I never really started dating her until I got out of the service. I see. And then, like I said, we were married in 46. We had okay. three children after I graduated from college. Right. So after I graduated, while I was in college, I was continued to work at this pharmaceutical company. <coughs> and uh, you know, between classes, weekends, evenings, and so forth. So after I graduated, I was hired full-time as the production manager. And I worked there, that was in 1940, or 52. Uh, there were several changes of ownership. I think from 1950, uh, 1950 until 1984, uh, there were seven changes of ownership. And I was lucky that I was able to retain my job because a lot of times when the other company takes you over, they got people that, you know, know your job and you're out. But I was the only pharmacist. Every time we had an acquisition, there was never a pharmacist in the group. So I think that's what got me going. So anyhow, I worked uh, at that company until I retired in 1988. Okay. I want to take you all the way back now. Okay. <laughs> Um, your mom and dad, did you, and did you have siblings? Yes, I had. Well, what did your dad do for a living? My dad was a draftsman at the William Powell Company. Oh, and, sure. And, uh, of course, my mother and mothers didn't work back in those days. Right. Uh, she was a house, housewife, stay-at-home mom. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I had one, sis oh, one older sister, two younger sisters and a younger brother. Okay. And anything you want to know about that? Well, well leading, up, leading up to the war, mm -hmm. you know, there were all sorts of uh, job things that other people were doing. Mm -hmm. Were any of your, your family involved in any of that? Were they preparing for the war or supporting the war? Like uh, your dad, if he was a, a, a Draftsman. The draftsman, uh, no, Powell he, Valve must have yeah. had some. He still continued to work there. I don't know if they were doing any government work. Yeah, that's what I was During that period that, or yeah. not. But as far as I know, he was still doing the same thing they always did. Okay, okay. <coughs> so. And then, okay, now, um, now what, what do your children do? Are they all still local or? No, I <coughs> did I mention? Yeah, I mentioned I had four children. Okay, two of them live out of town. One in Chicago, son lives in Chicago. The youngest daughter lives in New York. And uh, the other two daughters live uh, locally here in town. Okay. Um, I have 11 grandchildren, six great grandchildren. <laughs> uh, Anything else to, while well, we're on that subject? I think I want to ask you You were stationed in Australia, mm -hmm. so you were a crossover. What was some of the office duties you were doing? What was what was what was going on in Australia? When I was there, not much as far as the war goes. I mean, uh, all the uh, most of the men were uh, uh, over in New York. Uh, 
European theater in Africa. And uh, there were a lot of girls. <laughs> they, well, I guess, were you working on a base that, that was a US base or was an Australian base? Where, where were you working when you were in Australia? What was it that you, where were you? Actually, they were billeting us in an old winery. It's about four stories high. And uh, the mess hall was uh, like on the third floor, if I recall. And the other three floors were just billeting, you know, where we slept and we had our bunks. And mm -hmm. that was right in downtown Brisbane, about three or four blocks from where MacArthur's office was. Was MacArthur there at the same time you were? In yeah, yes, he was, yeah. I guess you never saw him, though. But I did. I saw him. In fact, one of the guys in our outfit was his driver. Do you have a Yeah, only that I would just see him once in a while uh, with uh, the guy in our outfit driving him around Brisbane. Uh, that's about closest contact I had. I'm trying to get my brain around <laughs> where he was at or why he was there during that time of the war. Um, was that before the I Philippine push or was that afterwards? Before the what? Philippines. Where he. When yeah. MacArthur. Yeah, I think he had to leave the Philippines because the Japanese. He oh, he did, yeah. He wanted to leave the Philippines, and I think he was in Australia. Yeah, he and his wife and his young son, Arthur MacArthur, were shipped down to Australia. And it was in Brisbane, I think, where he, you know, set up his headquarters. I guess he was. I didn't think. Planning, I don't think. I don't. Planning battles in, in, uh, down in that area. So. No, like I said. Before I got there, the Japanese were on the northern coast of Australia. And uh, probably uh, they were still there when MacArthur first got there. But then it was his job to drive them out and up to New, up to New Guinea and from New Guinea to Philippines. And See, I can't say that I ever remember hearing that MacArthur was there to confront the Japanese in Australia. I, I guess I didn't know that. Yeah, I think he was, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I never hear much about Australia. I was just curious at what was going on. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess you were just at a safe base to <coughs> move, to, you know, to start counter the, start the counterattack against Japan, I guess? Yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But were there, were there much with Australian troops? We would see a few of them maybe home on leave, and that was it. So there was mostly I think they American were, they troops. They were engaged mostly in the European theater. Yeah, but the troops that were there were they were they guys that were uh, preparing to go to some of the islands in the Pacific? You think? I really don't know. Yeah. I know they used to call them diggers. <laughs> that was a nickname for a Australian soldier, a digger. They had all kinds of expressions in Australia. Yeah. So how long you were in uh, Australia for how long? From uh, August of 43. I might have said February of 4. It was an, uh, I landed there in August of 43 and left in January of 45. And then you went to the Philippines? I was on my way up to the Philippines by way of New Guinea. So, yeah. uh, so you were in New Guinea for a while too? Just for about six weeks. W what were you doing there? Waiting to go to Australia. <laughs> Waiting to go to, go to the Philippines. Philippines. And what were your impressions of New Guinea? Do you have any memories of the natives or uh, living conditions? Or Never really saw a lot of them. Uh, I had had pictures that uh, a friend of mine that I met in Australia from home, quite accidentally. Mm -hmm. He was in New Guinea, and uh, when we uh, got up to New Guinea, I connected with him again. He just uh, showed me some pictures he had of New Guinea natives, you know. But never really saw it. We were pretty confined uh, area. We couldn't roam about very much. We were just waiting to go to Philippines, were you were know. Were they making you do stuff when you were in New Guinea? Did you have certain duties or anything? Not or much. Played a lot of cards, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> we were just, just, just waiting. Just occupying New Guinea at that point. Oh, the Americans were at that point, yeah. Right. yeah. Well, I was just wondering, when you got to the Philippines, and you were talking about that building, but did you see a lot of damage in the, in the Philippines?
Yeah, yeah I did. I saw a lot of body parts in the street, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, How did you get to the Philippines? Was it by, sh by ship? Ship, yeah. Okay, yeah. How long did that take? Uh, see, I remember we left, uh, we left New Guinea uh, in April, and I think uh, we were up there in a matter of uh, a week or so. And what kind of ship was that? The one from uh, New Guinea to uh, the Philippines was a, uh, it was a landing craft, it was a big one. I forget what they call it, L something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, from uh, Australia to New Guinea, we flew in a in a uh, uh, a seaplane. And then, oh. and then from uh, uh, that was Port Moresby. From Port Moresby, went up to Hollandia in a British Liberty ship. And then, then we had this. Uh, landed craft that went to Manila. I, only, I had four trips on the sea while I was in the Army, and the, the only one was, the only American ship was on my way home. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. And what, was, what ship was that? Do you remember the name of it? No. 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 Uh, the one I went from Oakland to Australia was a Dutch, or a, yeah, it was a Dutch luxury liner that was Converted for troops. Oh, really? Called the Clipfontein. I remember the name of that one, but <laughs> the British Liberty ship, I didn't remember the name of that okay. or the landing craft. Okay, now now back to the Philippines mm -hmm. when, you know, uh, some of the damage and obviously there was some, you know, it was kind of war torn at that well, point. I started to say that there was no water supply uh, in homes. Uh, people would you'd see them gathering around fire plugs to take uh, baths, mm -hmm. showers. There were no lights, all electricity was out. People would burn uh, lamps with coconut oil. Uh, it was essentially just dark at night. So. And, and where were they putting you at? Were you in? I was uh, billet, we were billeted in the Manila Hotel, <laughs> which was also damaged. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it pretty well, the Japanese pretty well wrecked everything before they left. Did you see a lot of Japanese POWs? No. Didn't see any. The only thing I saw was, like I said, Japanese body parts. Well, Japanese were well known for building tunnels and stuff. Did they have those over there also, do you know? I have no, never saw one. Yeah, because they usually bunkered in, yeah. in tunnels yeah. uh, like they did was, at Iwo Jima. They, were, they were so far ahead of where I was, I never really saw I much see. at all. Right, yeah. yeah. Mostly in the city. Yeah, well, like I said, Manila, which was, I guess, the biggest city in the Philippines. Do you remember your, with the natives? I, I remember talking to one guy, he remembered the poverty was really bad in the Philippines. The what? Poverty, like poor people. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was. Did you see much of that? Yes, a lot of poor people roaming around. Yeah, living conditions were bad then. Um, it, you were obviously in administration, right? Yeah. And so, uh, what was your exact job? I mean, did you process orders? Did you? Uh, I had to fill out a morning re when I was a company clerk. Fill out a morning report. That was my daily job. Um, accounting had, for personnel and stuff. I'm sorry. Accounting for personnel. Yeah. Right. Okay. And when we would. Uh, uh, have any kind of uh, inspections or anything. I had a roster of everybody. We used to have these uh, uh, inspections uh, maybe once a month or so where you brought in the doctor to check you for venereal yeah. disease, that sort of thing. I used to get a lot of bribes on that. <laughs> uh, Who was the commanding officer of that? that well, my, battalion or whatever it was. My particular one was, uh, I was uh, had a report to a first sergeant, a lieutenant, 
uh, and a captain. I can't remember, I remember the lieutenant's name was Thurman. I can't remember the captain's name, but uh, we were, when we were stationed in Brisbane, we heard so much about Sydney. We all wanted to go to Sydney for a furlough. I mean, getting a furlough home was out of the question unless you had an immediate sure. death in the family. So uh, they, they let half of our company go to Sydney for a week furlough. And they were having so much fun down there that they applied to the Red Cross for an extension. <laughs> so when my <laughs> company commander got wind of that, he wanted to know who was running this company, the Red Cross or him. So when they came back, nobody else got to go down. So <laughs> I never made it to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> but my wife and I did, uh, in 1993, we uh, took a tour to Australia. We were three weeks in Australia and a week in New Zealand. And we spent a few days in Brisbane. I showed her where we were billeted, but the old winery was gone. And there was a new off uh, modern office building there then. So I got to go to a lot of places. and. 93 that I would like to have gone when I was in the service, but couldn't. Mm -hmm. And we really enjoyed that trip. Yeah. Very nice trip. Right. That's on my bucket list. I'm sorry? That's on my bucket list. Oh, it is? <laughs> Australia? <laughs> Be prepared for a long flight. <laughs> Took 14 hours and 10 minutes from Los Angeles. Um, I had a fleeting thought there for a second about the personnel. I, I pro I, how many people, how many service troops were there in, in uh, when you were there? Australia. I have no idea. I don't remember. And you don't know what the troops were out front try, uh, no. uh, trying to overrun the no, Japanese? The infantry division, we, okay. MacArthur's headquarters was in the infantry. Okay, right. And I'm sure that I probably would have been one of those guys if I hadn't missed so much of my basic training. Right, you know, up in the thick of it. Did they? The, the, were you allowed to go home on leave before you shipped out? No. So they, you went from, from basic training, delayed basic training, straight to Australia. Right. Okay. I, when I came home in December of '45, was the first time I was there since February of '43. Wow. Okay. So. Did I get what? Did you get tested or anything for that? No. How did you get placed in the job? Did you know how I to think, I think uh, they just figured that I missed too much uh, training, that I didn't have much of a shot in combat. So they gave me a, essentially it was an office job, desk job. Yeah. Somebody had to do that too, so. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. Everybody had a part in the war right. and yeah. everybody had a support Part. So right. th those were all important jobs. Yeah. Uh, right. So, how are we on time? We're good. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I can't uh, think of anything. I think I covered pretty much everything I can remember. Well, I had, I had a question. Sure. One of the, one of the questions we asked is, uh, do you remember? You mentioned it, but I was wondering maybe. Where were you when you heard about uh, Pearl Harbor being attacked? Do you remember what you were doing? And yeah, and I was. Uh, I was on my way to Wright Aeronautical Corporation to work. We were working seven days a week then. So I got in a car. We had a carpool, and uh, I got in a car. One of the guys in the carpool said, "They bombed Pearl Harbor this morning." That's the first I heard of it. Then. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, when we got to uh, the plant, we used to bring our lunch. We had to inspect our lunch boxes. Uh, things were kind of regimented already, you know. And uh, that day, uh, they put over the PA system Roosevelt's talk about uh, being uh, engaged in war with Japanese, and uh, we all listened to that, and uh, 
while we're on the subject of Roosevelt's talk that day, uh, you're probably aware of this. Uh, when we took the honor flight uh, to the World War II Memorial, we had all these plaques and everything, and they had that speech that he made, mm -hmm. except for the last few words, so help us God, they left that off. I didn't think that was right. I agree. Yeah. And, and kind of related to that, you, you were said you were in the Philippines when you heard the atomic bomb was dropped. Do mm -hmm. you remember what you were doing when you heard that news? And what, what the, the, other, the other GI and I were at this Rosario apartment uh, working on it. Uh, and uh, the guys at the base, which was about 10 miles from where we were, kept calling us on the phone about every five minutes. They were all celebrating. Did you hear the war was over? Blah, blah, blah. You know, we were out there by ourselves and doing nothing. So, yeah, that's what I was doing when I heard about the bomb. I was wondering, did you have much memory of when you heard about the atomic bomb? Did that seem like that was sort of science fiction or something? Or did you? No, I just thought it was remarkable. Uh, it's terrible that, you know, of all the destruction and the lives lost, but. There's another way to look at it. If that had not happened, how many more of our lives? That's exactly right. Yeah. I've talked to a lot of guys who, who were going to be going to Japan, probably the same like you, and they, they're very, they're more very happy because they, you know, that would have been a tough fight to try to right. occupy Japan. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that's, you know, when, when you go back and reconstruct the wars, you know, how they, you know, you had the Iwo Jima and you had all these other islands that they were, yeah. that the Japanese were burrowed in and then right. we came in and, and uh, yeah. overtook the islands mm -hmm. and they were on their way to Japan. So right. it had to be right about that time when you were there in the Philippines. Well, they were always ahead of me, the combat. Always ahead of you there, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Yeah. When you were in Manila, where was, where was MacArthur when he was in the Philippines? You know, where part of the Philippines he was? I think he was in Manila too, but you know, I did not see him when he I was in Manila. Up. He what? He didn't give you a call? No, <laughs> 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 no he did. <laughs> like, yeah, I finally arrived, huh? <laughs> yeah. Did he already make, I guess you, when you, was he already there? I guess he had already done his return thing. Walked on the beach and everything. Yeah, I heard that was staged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he gave that famous speech. Well, when he left Corregator, he said, I shall return, you know. I guess when he was sloshing through the water off of that little landing craft, he says, I have returned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he did not want to leave the Philippines when they were, the, when they flew him out of there. Right. You That's know, when he said Truman that. brought him home. Right. Right. Now, I know he was very unhappy about that. Yeah, his guys were getting slaughtered over there. Yeah. And he wasn't happy yeah. about it. Yeah. He wanted to go to Korea. And <laughs> finish it off. Did you ever keep in touch with anybody you knew that you served with? Did I ever see who? Did you ever keep in touch with anybody that you served with in the military? You mean after I got home? Yeah, yeah. over the uh, years. There was one fellow who lived in Cleveland who was on our, my outfit, went up to see him uh, for a weekend. And that's about it. I did have a, uh, when I was in Australia, a, uh, my brother-in-law's brother was in the Navy, and he just happened to be in Australia the same time I was, just for a short period. I guess his ship just pulled in. He knew I was in Brisbane, so I got together with him. Uh, he was there for a few weeks, so we used to see each other occasionally. That's who you referred to before, that you knew somebody, that you met somebody that you knew? Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. Well, it's also, no, that, one of the fellows I worked with at this photo uh, photographer shop. Oh. Okay. I met him in Australia also. Oh, okay. But that was not my brother-in-law's brother. Okay. Yeah, he was a co-worker. Okay. Yeah, I met two people in Australia, in New Guinea, that I knew from home, just quite by accident. I'm, I'm trying to remember, you mentioned you worked at the right plant. Mm-hmm. Were you working there after Pearl Harbor? Were you still working there up until you got into the... I was working there before Pearl Harbor. But were you working there af at before you got uh, drafted? Yeah. So I, what kind of stuff were they doing after Pearl Harbor at the right plant? 
Same thing, making the aircraft engine. Just making a lot more of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had 20 or you know three shifts going constantly, and a lot of women workers. Do you remember what they were making? What aircraft? I don't know. All I know is they were making aircraft engines, but I don't know what planes oh, they put them on. Right. No, yeah. no, no. It was. Uh, I was working there, started there before Pearl Harbor, and then I was there until February of 43. So that was a little over a year. I was, that's why I was interested to see if your, any of your siblings were part of that, that buildup of, you know, I didn't know if they worked in a plant like that uh, to well, support the war effort. My sister, one sister worked for a doctor, another one worked for uh, an insurance company, I think, mm -hmm. and my brother, he also went to Elder and joined the Navy after he got out. Okay. Uh, what year did he graduate from Elder, do you remember? Well, he was seven years younger, so I guess uh, oh, okay. 1946. Okay. Yeah. Did you, since you were in the Army, did you go through Fort Thomas? I did. That's where I was inducted. What was Fort Thomas? Do you remember your, any memories of, of what that was like? I mean, I don't know if you've been over there since, if it was no. much different. All I remember is getting up very early in the morning and standing around <laughs> <laughs> waiting for breakfast. <laughs> but I guess you, they did. you were only there for a couple of days. Like oh, yeah, just a few days. I was, we were allowed to go home in the evening. You come, just showed up come to, back. to yeah. do paperwork? Yeah. Yeah, just, maybe, just waiting to be assigned, that's all. And then they, you left them there by train from Fort Thomas? From Fort Thomas. Okay. What did you report to next after the Fort Thomas building? The next step. After I reported. Yeah. Oh yeah, we boarded the train to go out to California. Did the train leave from Fort Thomas? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Not not Union Station then. Or it could have. Yeah. There was a lot of buzzing going on at Union Station oh, yeah, right. at that time. A lot of people leaving, some coming home. Yeah, I think we did take off from Union Station. Yeah. Did they stop along the way? Was this yeah. Three, every three days, or how long did it take? It to, to stop took five there? days to get out there because we had to stop for scheduled uh, trains. Oh, right. That's right. They yeah. wouldn't let you guys get priority, right? They, they wouldn't what? You didn't have priority. No, we didn't. No. Yeah, that's no. right. I heard that. And you know, we were set. We were sitting in a coach for five days, and as far as sleeping, all you could do is maybe lean back a little bit. You know, wasn't a very good experience being Ooh. feverish and everything. You know. Oh yeah. But were you, you were you given any kind of uniform at Fort Thomas? We were. We were issued winter uh, khakis. You know. Okay. What they call us gray. Uh, the color of our uniforms, not not the summer ones, the uh, winter wool ones. Yeah, I know, I know what you're referring to. I can't remember the name. They had a name for them. Yeah. Utilities. No, no, it wasn't utility. <laughs> it was olive drab. That's what it was. The, oh, okay, that's right. <laughs> but I guess you never had to use winter stuff where you were going in Australia. No, nope. Brisbane. Tem the temperature in Brisbane was about like Miami, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> it was on the same. Uh, what would you call that? Latitude south of of the uh, equator as Miami was north. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where that is in Australia. Is that because it's like is on it the on east the, coast? Is it on the coast? Is it kind of? Well, most everything was on the east coast in Australia. Right. <laughs> um, it's a lot of outback there. Country size of the country in square miles is about the same as the United States. But the, the uh, population of Australia, when I was there, was equivalent to about the population in New York City. Maybe, wow. Yeah. Very yeah. undeveloped. A lot of outback, and yeah. The, and the inland probably. Yeah, doesn't. yeah. Wow. Wonder, well, I'm just wondering why, why were you stationed in that part of Australia? Was there some strategic reason? Just because it was... Well, I think because it was mostly inhabited on the East Coast, you know. Uh, 
when we cross the equator, we had to go through an initiation process. Got all of my hair shaved off, <laughs> for one thing. <laughs> Some guys had to take bites of raw fish and dunk them in, in a tank of water. <laughs> I thought that this Navy guy did that. I didn't know they did that. The, the Navy Army guys guy. did it to the <laughs> Army guy. <laughs> we were on a troop ship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Okay, well. Once again, uh, Mr. Schoen, we'd like to thank you very much for sharing your memories with us, and uh, we appreciate it. Glad to do that. You take care of yourself. Thank you. I will. <laughs>